the most effective way to use cardio is not for its aesthetic benefit. It's for its performance benefit. Yeah. Use cardio to build stamina. This reminds me of how people screw up strength training. Use strength training to get stronger and you'll build the muscle. If mm -hmm. all you're focused on is building the muscle, at some point you'll start to sacrifice strength and lose muscle. The muscle is the side effect of the strength. The fat loss is the side effect of improved stamina and improved health. Cardio is the best way to improve general stamina. That's a fact, right? You could build stamina doing lots of different things, but if I wanted to build just stamina and endurance in a very quick period of time, the tool to do that is cardio. And if you look at cardio to do that, um, then you're going to approach it in a better way. Now, why? Because if, I, if I'm only approaching cardio from a weight loss perspective, I'm actually going to start to find myself sacrificing stamina and endurance. And you see people do this. They drop their calories, they add more cardio, drop their calories, add more cardio. They start to feel like dog crap and they're on the treadmill and you can look in their face and you're like, this person looks like they're going to fall down. Now, someone who's doing it for performance, what you're aiming for is performance. And so the diet tends to match it a little bit better. You, you have a more objective measurement like, oh, my stamina is better. I'm doing better versus I think I did. I burn more calories or I'm just adding more cardio. So use cardio for stamina, I would say, is the most important part Yeah, of well, and that also feeds into your strength training because mm -hmm. a lot of times if you're somebody who's like, let's say, the opposite end of the spectrum, somebody who never does cardio and they strength train, many times the limiting factor of you getting stronger or adding volume to your training is your lack of stamina. Yes. Mm -hmm. You you get gassed out. You know, you go do five sets of, you know, high rep squats and you're gassed out before 15, 20 minutes into the workout. And so – simply getting uh, better stamina if from cardio training is going to carry over and benefit your strength training and building muscle. But that's such a, it's such a fine line right. on how to do that because you can really go too far if you become so heavily focused on the cardio, the cardiovascular aspect, and you're also in, in a major calorie deficit. The combination of the two of those is a recipe for disaster. So understanding how to feed yourself appropriately and how to do just the right amount of cardio that you don't overdo it and send the wrong signal. Yeah, and, and you know, along those lines, cardio done <clears throat> properly improves mitochondrial health, which is very important for the whole body, but including muscle. It also improves the ability of your body to use satellite cells to repair and build more muscle. In other words, your lack of stamina and endurance could be a roadblock to building more strength and more muscle as well. I learned this firsthand years ago. I was at one point so extreme with the the whole you know calorie burning that we talked about because my insecurity was being too skinny and I wanted to build muscle. My, it was the opposite for me. I was like, don't burn any calories unless I absolutely need to, mm -hmm. even though again, very stupid approach. I didn't know any better. And so I avoided any activity that burned calories that <laughs> I thought would be like not needed because I need to preserve those calories for muscle. So not only did I not do cardio, I tried not to do anything that burned calories aside from strength training. And I remember I did this challenge, this trainer, uh, one of my trainers, it was very, him and I were, were friends. And I remember him making fun of me. And he's like, I bet you can't do 20 minutes on a stationary bike. And I got on it. And I remember 10 minutes in, I was gassed out. And I said, oh, this is probably not good. So I started doing a little bit of cardio. Not a lot, but just enough because I was kind of like embarrassed. Like I can't even do the stationary bike. And then I noticed my strength training got better. And then I realized like, oh, my health. My health was, was, was and my stamina were getting in the way of me, you know, building muscle. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing. Like I, I went through that same process of just, lifting weights and trying to get strong and avoiding cardio after like, you know, playing sports forever and doing like the highest volume of cardio I could possibly have done um, to see the benefit of, of strength training by itself. But then you get to the point where in your workouts and you're just hitting that fatigue and, it, and it's affecting the way that you're lifting and your technique. And, um, and for me, it's always like, I'm always trying to improve whatever I'm doing and be effective as possible at it. I'm not as effective as I can if that fatigue sneaks in too early there. And so, uh, to interrupt that and then focus more on cardio help to elevate, you know, my performance with just lifting weights, uh, in general. And so in between that, just getting up and down, uh, out of my chair and walking up the stairs and I'm strong, but I'm also like huffing and puffing. I shouldn't be doing that. I yeah. should be energetic and, and vibrant. Yeah. The, doing it right. the next point here is 
to use strength training in your routine to support uh, your metabolism. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. Well, first off, let's talk about the metabolism. Strength training directly tells your body to, to preserve or build muscle, okay? And muscle is a very important part to the calorie burn of your body at rest that if you want to burn more calories, you prob you definitely want to have a good amount of muscle mass. It just makes fat loss easier. In a modern society, having a faster metabolism is an asset. Now, a 100,000 years ago, you know, the guy who had a super fast metabolism, well, he's probably going to die because it's hard for him to find 3,000 calories in nature unless he was like the most successful hunter of all time. It was a bad thing. Well, today, a fast metabolism is, is not, is an asset. It's a total asset. Like if you burn it off, the negative effects of even unhealthy food are largely negated. Not 100%, but largely. I mean, they have studies where people go on a fast food diet but drop their calories below what they're burning. And almost all of their, you know, objective measurements, blood lipids and all that stuff start to improve. So a fast metabolism is this, is this huge asset and you got to use strength training to support that. Here's the kicker. If your goal is purely stamina and endurance, some strength training will improve that as well. So even when I trained triathletes and marathon runners, one of the best ways I got them to get better at their sport was to have them build a little bit of strength with some strength training. And then of course, uh, you know, it, it helped with them being able to burn more calories and all that other stuff. So strength training should always be a party routine is the point here. And especially if cardio is how you like to work out, um, you got to have it in there. You absolutely have to have it in there. Well, yeah, no, you don't want to be weak and frail and, and trying to run. I also, this also reminds me too, on, on, from just a fat loss perspective, how much this has shifted from when I started as a trainer to now, like, so let's say somebody came in uh, when I was a young trainer and I just started and they wanted to lose 50 to hundred pounds, um, you know, in say the first month goes by, we would be celebrating a 15 to 20 pound weight loss where the strength training to build your metabolism is so important that that same client, if I were to get them today, I wouldn't want to do that. I would want a month to go by and actually not see the scale go down. And that's really hard for the client and even coaches that are listening to this right now to wrap their brain around that. That, wait a second, this person comes in, they want to lose 50 to 100 pounds, and you don't want to see the scale go down in the first month at all. And it's like, yeah, no, I don't want to see that because I'm so focused on the building the me metabolism aspect of strength training because of how important it is that I'm going to focus in that direction. That's something totally different I would do today than what I would have done when and I first it made, And it made you far more successful. I came to that same conclusion. I know you did too, Justin. Yep. All right. Next is when you look at cardio, if you're going to do it for, you know, and, and one of the side effects you'd like is fat loss. <clears throat> Cardio isn't all the same. There are forms of cardio that are more like strength training and other forms of cardio that are not, less like strength training. The forms of cardio that are more like strength training are more likely to preserve muscle, in some cases may even build a little bit of muscle, um, at the very least are the least likely to cause your body to lose muscle, okay? And one of those forms of cardio, if it's appropriate, I want to say that because it has to be appropriate, mm -hmm. is high-intensity interval training type of cardio. A good example would be sprints. If you practice sprinting, this is a short, explosive form of cardiovascular training, your body is less likely to want to pare muscle down because in order to produce power, you need strength. Here's your evidence. Look at sprinters and then look at long-distance runners. Mm -hmm. Do they look the same at all? No, they don't. One of them is heavily muscled. And the other one has very little. And they muscle. both technically run a lot. They both run. Yeah. yeah. They both run a lot. Yeah. But one of them is more strength focused. The other one is more purely endurance focused. So I would look at high intensity interval training as a form of cardio so that if fat loss is definitely something you're interested in, because it's not going to result uh, at least like other forms of cardio and the same risks when it comes to slowing down uh, the metabolism. Yeah. This is such a powerful one. Do you remember, do you guys remember when this, like when it hit, like, that study? Yeah. Oh, I remember. It changed everything. I mean, I think- All of a sudden, oh, everybody- study, yeah. yeah. The, the bike, right? The stationary bike and doing those intervals. Yeah. I just think that when that when that first came, it was like in the- what was it? it was early 2000s? Yeah. Early 2000s or late 90, uh, 1990-something. Like, it was definitely in that era. And then from the net, for the next decade, I felt like that became the yeah. way that yeah. like all trainers trained. And like anything else, we take that bit of information or study and- Go too far. 
and then we go too far. Yeah. There's still uh there's still a balance to this that you don't want you don't want to overdo it because you still want to get the benefits of, you know, utilizing weights in the form of building muscle. You don't want to just circuit train where you're not resting. So there's there's this fine line of learning how to utilize interval training for cardio, how to use interval training for weight training and mm -hmm. to not overdo it. But this is by far my favorite way to to utilize any sort of cardiovascular training because I feel like you get the great benefits of stamina building, and then you also get these perks of uh, burning body fat and calories, and then you also have a higher chance of maintaining and holding on to your yeah, muscle mass. I, well, I, I know it's like such a, a simple and, and a reductionist way to kind of look at this, but like I – I just really focused on a lot of the like the body types like you see with sprinters or you see with um, speed skaters or you see with like some of these guys like on um, those cycles that where they would sprint and do do cycle oh, sprints. Super muscular. You just look at their muscles and just look at their their physique and in comparison to anybody that's running any kind of distance in yeah, terms nerves. of like what what that. Uh, the high performance athlete looks like you know in general and so you kind of like kind of reverse engineer that and, and look at their training habits and in the amount of, of volume of like, uh, you know, aerobic versus anaerobic training. And so, yeah, there's definitely a sweet spot in there where you can get all the benefits of stamina, but also too, you're not sacrificing that muscle. Mass. Yeah. And I, I do want to add this. I said earlier, appropriate application, and you talked about Adam, how people go too far as we're talking, anything we talk about needs to be applied appropriately with good programming. Uh, we said hit great form of cardio, least likely to cause muscle loss. Can you overdo hit or can it be done? Yep. Can it be done by someone where they shouldn't be doing hit? Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. It is intense. It is. It does stress the body a little more. There's people I would never do hit with. Um, and then there's some people where it does, where it does very well. So the tool has to be appropriate, um, uh, regardless of what we talk about. Okay. This next one for me is the most important. Okay. And that is to simply use cardio for health. This for me is how I like to use cardiovascular type training. Stamina, as long as my stamina is good enough for me to do what I enjoy, which is play with my kids, go on the occasional hike and lift weights. I'm not, I don't really care too much about having tons of endurance and stamina just because it's not, it doesn't improve the quality of, of my life anymore. I don't compete in anything that requires it. If I did, I would train specifically for it. Um, but I do like to feel healthy. So what kind of cardio do I do? Hiking, walking, um, I'll do things like push the sled or do functional type of ex exercise in the gym. This for me is where I get the most benefit. This is how I used to apply it to most of my clients, mainly because it requires the least amount of skill and it's the less stressful in the body. And if you do it this way, it also is recuperative in a sense. So when I take the average person and all I do is simply increase the amount of walking that they do appropriately, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't stress their recovery ability to where I have to really look at my workout with them and compensate or change or reduce volume. If anything, it tends to improve it. This for most people, I think is the way that they should look at cardio is what can I do just to make myself feel better right. and, and feel more healthy? There's so many benefits to that. I know like non-exercise uh, activity thermogenesis, like, so that's not like, it's not cardio, right? right. And, and that's, there's a, there's a clear difference with that. So it's not any activity that's structured where you're rigorously kind of going through, um, you know, running patterns or jogging or anything, but like keeping that relatively low intensity, um, I mean, it, it builds up a lot of that potential activity that's that's restorative recuperative uh to where you get a lot of blood flow and your heart you know gets gets adequate work so there's lots of health benefits to that and adding that into uh your routine um but i again it, this is where it's like if it's for health like it's it's not necessarily the most intense bouts of cardio that's right. yeah i think that's why i like as a trainer positioning it this way because I think when you communicate it for health, I don't know, for me, like words that I, I attach to health is balance. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. health, when you talk yeah, about- Yeah, there's performance about, and then there's health. Right. And yeah, when yeah. you talk about fat loss and building muscle, that sounds more performance. And that and so people's brains go just naturally gra uh, gravitate towards, oh, more is better. Yeah, or harder is better. Yeah. yeah. You know, like harder, more of it is, is better for me, no matter how much you try and communicate otherwise. They just do that versus when I tell someone like, oh, we're going to do this for health. 
They just seem to have a better attitude, a better approach to it. And it, and it really is the way to do this. Like, I mean, it's the most important muscle in your body. So we need to exercise it. We yeah. need to train it. That's a, that's a given. And I know that we've been, I think, you know, pegged as this, these guys that are anti-cardio. It's just that when we look at the sea of people like being pegged. that are, <laughs> that are utilizing cardio they're all using it the wrong way like nobody is using it the right i shouldn't say nobody very few people are using it the right way and so the reason why you keep hearing that message from us all the time is because we're trying to talk to the majority and a majority of people right. think of cardio as this great fat loss tool and it's a terrible fat loss tool it is way better served for building stamina and endurance and for overall health. And if you do it for those reasons, you'll get the fat loss. I know, and that's the irony yeah. of it, right? Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, the next, this next point I love because cardio is quite unique in this particular way, right? So if you look at strength training, there's definitely a variety of ways you could strength train under the strength training umbrella. There's Olympic lifting, power lifting, there's bodybuilding, you can use kettlebells, you can do body weight type training, bands, that kind of stuff, right? So it's, it is it is an umbrella that it does encompass different ways, but cardio encompasses a lot more. Cardio is pretty much anything that gets you breathing a little hard and it could be anything that's fun. I mean, literally I could go play with my kids at the park for an hour and I did cardio. I could go on a hike and I did cardio. I could go uh, do yard work and be productive. And guess what? It's cardio. So this next point is very important, which is pick what you enjoy. Mm -hmm. If you enjoy doing any type of activity, that is going to be one of the best forms of cardio for you because it's going to be the one you enjoy doing and what's going to be the one you do. In fact, anytime somebody asks me, hey, what's the best form of cardio? My question was always, well, which one do you enjoy the most? Let's do that one. So if you enjoy swimming, yeah. then that should be your form of cardio. You like hiking? There's your form of cardio. You want to go play Frisbee with your kids and run around? There's your form of cardio literally do what you enjoy, then becoming consistent is a piece of cake. That's the beautiful part of hobbies and sports. It's like, you, it's just something that you, you fall into because you enjoy it. You don't really, you're not focused on turning that into a workout or some kind of work and it's something that you have to do. It's, it's just, it's good because you're, you're expressing movement, you're, you're getting blood flow, you're, um, you know, you're, you're working your body in a way that's beneficial, but also too, it's just fun and, and engaging. And so it's something like you continuously want to, to promote and, and do this type of activity. So, uh, I'm always trying to find like some of those, some of those things where it just gets me up off the couch and, and less sedentary so I can get out and, and do something productive. Yeah. Now to, to, to comment on that, here's why that's so important <clears throat> besides the whole, you're going to be consistent because you like it. One of the biggest challenges that people have with exercise is creating a relationship with the exercise that's a positive one. Well, if every time you get up to do something that's a workout or for your health and yet you hate it and it sucks, the relationship you're developing is a terrible one. It's one where you are getting up every day to meet somebody that you just don't like, but I got to do it. You know, type of, at some point when stress gets a little high, schedule gets a little tough, one of the first things to fall off is the thing you don't like. That's just a fact. That's human behavior. Well, if you do something and you enjoy it, um, you're going to develop a relationship with it where it's something that you want to continue doing. Or in general, this is a wonderful thing, in general, you develop a relationship with activity that is more positive. You don't, People don't realize this. There's this conscious and unconscious effect from this relationship building you get with exercise. The conscious one is you're aware, like, ooh, I like this. This is fun. There's an unconscious one too, though, which is, you know, when you're playing with your kid, for example, when I play with my kids and I'm outside and I'm playing with my two and a half year old and we're running around and we're playing and I'm breathing hard and whatever, I'm not really paying attention to how much the breathing hard sucks. I'm paying attention more to how much fun we're having. Subconsciously, I'm building a relationship with breathing hard that is fun, that's enjoyable. And believe me, this, this spreads out and connects to a lot of different things in life. And all of a sudden, the challenge of cardio becomes something that you've now developed a positive relationship with. So I can't understate this. Doing what you enjoy as a, a form of your cardio is so important for consistency lifelong that, you know, this, um, this should have been number one, in fact. I'm glad you went the relationship direction because I actually think this is one of the biggest challenges, even with people that say they love to do these activities. It's like comparing somebody who does like a volunteer job versus somebody who punches in a clock. 
And you have these people that say that they love to play basketball. They love to play football. They love to, to go for long runs or whatever, but then they expect to get paid. Mm. Their, their, their expectations of what you get in return are where the relationship is off. It's like, if you love to do these things, you should do those, pursue those things. Just because, for the love of it. To just for the love of it, because you enjoy it. Because you, you feel good when you do it. You enjoy doing it. And those are the right reasons. Where people get mistaken is they think that they should get paid. They think that they should lose body fat. They, sh they think that they're, they're supposed to get these returns that don't always align up with what everything else that they're doing. So I think it's important that you understand your, your true relationship with that, because I don't know how many people have told me they love to do this form of cardio, but it, they, they say that, but then they're frustrated because they're not getting paid because they're not seeing this huge body fat loss yeah. because of their approach look, at it. And so it's important you understand that. Look, look, I said this a long time ago, uh, but it's the supplies, right? The, the man who loves walking is going to walk further than the man who loves the destination. You love what you do. You're going to do it more than if you did it just because you were looking for fat loss. Just a fact. Yeah. All right. The next one, let's talk about diet because we can't talk about weight loss and fat loss um, and avoiding muscle loss, especially when cardio becomes one of the cornerstones of your workout. Um, we, we have to talk about diet because this plays such an important role. So I would say the most important thing, number one, is to consume a high protein diet. High protein is muscle preserving, period, end of story, okay? Even if you're doing everything you can with your workouts to lose muscle, if your protein intake is high, you'll lose less muscle than if your protein intake wasn't high. Now, what's high? Well, it's around a gram of protein per pound of target body weight. I say target body weight because if you're trying to lose 50 pounds, don't use your current body weight. Use the body weight you want to hit. There's your protein targets. That's number one. Number two, don't consume calories that are way below what you're burning, don't do the whole, I'm going to be in a thousand calorie deficit or more. Too low of calories will send an emergency signal to your body that says, ignore the muscle building signals that from strength training, ignore everything else. We're burning way more than we're taking in. Number one priority is to slow the metabolism down. So a 500 calorie deficit for most people is right around where you want to be. Unless your calories are already so low, in which case I'd say, I wouldn't even have you in a deficit. I would have you at maintenance or above and slowly reverse diet you before we can get to that point. Yeah, I have a real hard time talking about this one while we're talking about cardio because it's so this is where it becomes really nuanced. When you are when you're using something like cardio uh and if you are if approaching it with this idea of fat loss, oh, but I also want to have better performance, oh, and I want to be healthy, you have all these different goals how you eat in relationship to how you utilize the cardio to me is is so so important and there's so many different ways that you could do that there'd be times where i actually would encourage somebody who is actually weight loss their goal is weight loss to feed themselves or have like a liquid drink before they go do their basketball for an hour because even though they want to do weight loss, I don't think it's smart for that person to be in this, like to your point, large calorie deficit and then go do something like high intensity basketball for an hour because of what potentially could happen. Well, what if you're training for stamina, that's exactly what you would do, right? Because yeah. it's going to give you more stamina. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think that's, I mean, that, that's why the, the diet part is probably the most nuanced part when you're also incorporating. It's not as straightforward, let's say. To somebody who you're just speaking to about building muscle and strength training, once you start adding the cardio element, learning how to utilize a deficit, and I, and I think the biggest mistake you see people do is to add it in addition to also doing a, a massive deficit. I'll add this. If your diet, if you're in a calorie deficit and you're doing this and you start to notice uh, significant reductions in performance, you're eating too little. Yeah. That'll, that, that's a great sign right there. Like, uh-oh, strength is going way down. Oh my God, my stamina is going down. You're probably eating too little, bump your calories up and, uh, and then start over at some point later when you're able to get your metabolism a little bit boosted. The high protein part though is consistent. Oh, that's, oh, that's, that's a, that's a no brainer. Yeah, yeah. You see this like the dead man walking where you get the load, uh, calorie, like the, in the deficit and, uh, high intensity cardio on top of that. Oh. You got to just think about like, 
if that's what you're doing right now, you want to be effective at what you're doing performance wise and be able to move effectively. And, and if you're not giving yourself enough uh, fuel to, to, to really get I, through that, you're not going to be effective. I do want to add, because we didn't touch on this and if we are training and doing, you know, cardio in our routine like this, um, this is also, especially if you're a healthy person and you're eating well, this is actually where the sodium thing is becomes really oh, important yeah. to pay attention yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. That's something that I probably wouldn't have really highlighted or noticed as much. Great but point. If you're a, if you consider yourself a health person or you're trying to get healthy, and so then you're you're eating healthy foods and making good choices, and you're also doing cardiovascular type of training, it's really important that your sodium intake is up and that you pay attention to that. So along the lines of diet, I would definitely say. Protein is the obvious the obvious focus, not being in too much of a deficit, probably even feeding yourself before you do these type of cardio bouts, and then also making sure your sodium is Yeah, up. in fact, I yeah. would uh, recommend uh, anybody in this category, unless otherwise told by a doctor, um, have electrolytes uh, mm -hmm. before and during yep. your cardio workouts. We work with a company called Element, uh, which is one of the best ones, and it's, it's calorie-free, so you're not adding anything other than sodium. And if your sodium is too low, your performance will drop. You will get cravings, and uh, it'll make this much more much more difficult. Lastly, okay, we talk about this with strength training, but it's also true for cardio. Depending on the form of cardio that you do, you got to get good at the skill uh, that you're performing so that the cardio becomes effective. All right, let me use an example. Let's talk about running, the most common form of cardio that people attempt. Running is a specific skill. Now, if you haven't run consistently since you were in high school or younger, and then all of a sudden you decide, I'm going to go run and do cardio. You better practice running and practice the skill of running before you try to attempt to test your stamina and endurance because when you get tired, your technique goes out the window even more. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens when you don't do this? Injury. Injury every single time. In fact, running is associated with more injuries than almost any form of exercise. And it's not because humans were not designed to run. In fact... Uh -huh. There's running a way is one of the things to do it. Yes. And, and that's the thing is your body has natural shock absorbers. If, if you're set up right and your, your gait is in the right uh, direction, you, you know, you're, you're striking with the pad of your foot. Like there's, there's a whole process to this that you have to learn the mechanics of it to appropriately not take on too much of that blunt force uh, into the joint. So um, to be able to learn that is, is going to be crucial uh, if this is a, a long-term passion of yours. Yeah, well, well, cardiovascular activity um, is uh, basically you could define it by repetitive movement, right? That would be one way to define it. It's repetitive movement over and over again. If that movement you're doing is suboptimal because it's constant and repetitive, then wear and tear and injury becomes extremely common. And it doesn't matter what you're doing. Cycling, running, swimming, doesn't matter. If you don't have the skill down properly, and you do it repetitively, and then you do it under fatigue, which makes technique really go down, You, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you'll hurt yourself, and then you've lost the ability now to perform this form of exercise and maybe other forms uh, of exercise. So the skill is very important. By the way, this is why the most commonly recommended form of cardio that I would give to people is walking, mm -hmm. because walking is the lowest skill form of cardio uh, thankfully today, as of the, you know, recording of this podcast, people still walk, who knows what that's going to look like in the future, but I could take the average person and tell them to walk more. And because they already walk daily to an extent, they've got the skill of walking down. So I don't have to like really make them like practice the skill, but if you're going to do anything other than something you already do, then what you want to do is you want to treat it like a skill. Now, don't worry. You're still working out. You're still active. You're just not approaching it with this. Like I got to go until I can't breathe anymore. You're starting it and you're like, I got to get better at this as a skill. And, and this also tends to make people train appropriately anyway. But trust me on this. If you run well, you'll get way more out of it than if you run poorly, even if you train just as hard both ways. You know what this reminds me of? Um, it was really common uh, when I was getting ready for a show, you'd see other competitors and it's like, uh, you're heading into the final weeks and everybody's doing their their bouts of cardio and stuff like that. And you'd see these these competitors just slouched over the stairmaster and just mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you know, going as fast as their legs will and the sweat's running off them and they're huddling on their and I'd and I'd go over next to him and I'd be like, you know, why don't you cut the speed in half and focus on standing up up tall with good posture, activate your core and pay attention to every step that you take. 
you'd have to move half as fast and you would get the exact same benefits and more. Minus the injury risk. Yes. Yeah. And it, and and just a bad pattern of like exactly. slouching, bad over. behavioral, yeah, just bad creating. behavioral to be holding like that, and no no activation of the core. You're slouched over there, but they're so addicted to the sweat and the hard and the move, but yet not realizing you could literally reduce the speed in half of what mm -hmm. you're doing. Stand upright, focus on every step that you strike, focus on activating your core, your shoulders, back while you're doing it. And your body's going to burn as many calories, if not more, plus work on your posture at the same time. It just was like so funny uh, to me. Yeah, that, totally. And and that's why I always loved the, like the incline feature versus like speed, you know, for a lot of people, just because too, to that fact, like once you like increase the speed of movement, like there's a lot more uh, potential, like bad, uh, uh, patterns that kind of uh, yep. come out. So yeah, it, it exposes all. You want your exercise regime. So when you look at like your, your, your whole health regime, right. And you're like, okay, I want to lose weight. I want to be healthy. I want to be fit. And we're talking about boosting metabolism. The exercise portion should be primarily focused on building muscle. That should be the foundation of your routine because nothing will boost your metabolism more on its own than having more active muscle. Muscle is expensive. It costs a lot of energy. It's and now the brain burns more calories and muscle on a pound for pound basis, but you can't build your brain necessarily, right? But you can build muscle. So building muscle is 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 one of the most effective strategies to boost your metabolism. So if you look at your workout, look at what you're doing and say, is this workout muscle building or is it endurance building or is it flexibility building or is it so the cornerstone, the focus should be on muscle building if you want a faster so, metabolism. So not circuit training. Not, Correct. Not, you know, uh, signing cardio. up for a race, not some Not athletic running, class. not cycling, not orange theory, yeah. not any of that stuff. It's literally strength training. Yep. It's lifting weights, right? The stuff that builds Longer muscle. rest periods, yeah. What, what builds muscle and strength. So it's going to look a lot differently than uh, what you're marketed to the most for, for burning calories. Yes, by, by, the, by the way, this would be the recommendation regardless of what you knew about this person's history. Almost always, right? So always. no matter what. But what's interesting about this is the people that tend to fall in this trap of having struggling with the yo-yo dieting and, and, and losing the weight and being stuck here all the time happen to be the people that tend to not train this way too. So you kind of get a double benefit. Yeah, You get the benefit of this is what they should be doing anyways to help speed the metabolism up. But you also get the novelty benefit of, oh, I'm the type of person that loves the circuit class or yeah. I love to train like an athlete or I love to sign up for a marathon when I try and get in shape. And so you not only get a benefit of like, this is one of the ideal ways for you to train to build a faster metabolism, but you also get the benefits of it because it's so novel for that person. Yeah, so so think of it this way. Now, some someone may be listening, like, God, circuit training burns so many calories though. Running burns so many calories. It's true. If you run for an hour, you're gonna burn a lot more calories than if you lift weights to build muscle. Okay, that's a fact. However, lifting weights to build muscle is like taking money and, and investing it and then allowing that money to make money for you. So think of it this way. You could take a job where you make a lot per hour or you could take a job where you make a little less per hour. However, you also get stock options and you know for a fact that this company is growing and go public. That's the difference. The difference is we're taking our training and we're gearing it towards investment. Can I get my metabolism to boost more so it burns more on its own versus let me try and burn this all on my own. By the way, if you're if you're not trying to train to build muscle and you're just burning a lot of calories, your body does a phenomenal way of adapting to that because your body's always trying to conserve energy. So if I just burn a lot of calories without a signal to build muscle, I will burn a lot of calories initially, but over time, my body's gonna figure out ways to slow its own metabolism down, to make me more efficient. And one of the main ways it does this is to actually get you to lose muscle. This is why studies will show diet. So people cut their calories plus lots of cardio, which is not strength training, right? It's not muscle building, but it is a lot of calorie burning. They'll see weight loss, but a chunk of that weight loss is muscle. How did that happen? Your body didn't burn the muscle off. Your body said, Hey, we're burning a lot of calories. We don't need a lot of strength. So let's become better at this activity by burning less calories. And so it actually starts to adapt. Efficiency. When you, yes. When you train for muscle, your body is saying, well, we're not burning a lot of calories. We're not even worried about that. In fact, what we need is more strength. We need more muscle. Keep packing it on. And when you combine it with the rest we're going to talk about, that's how you get the, the faster metabolism. Yeah. Let's talk about the exercises, right? So, so building muscle, training for muscle building is traditional strength training for the most part. Like bodybuilders or powerlifters or strength athletes. That's how you want to work out. 
But what about the exercises? What exercises are going to give you the most bang for your buck, especially if you're somebody that's only going to work out two or three days a week? Well, the evidence is clear. It's the big compound lifts. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the big gross motor movements, the, the barbell exercises, a barbell squat, a barbell bench press, a deadlift, a row, an overhead press. These exercises, just for the time spent doing them, gives you the most in terms of me metabolism boosting, the most in terms of muscle building. It would, it would require a lot of exercises combined to equal the muscle building effect of just one of those exercises. And when it comes in terms of time and recovery ability and all that stuff, it just makes sense to do the one, the yeah. exercises that give you the most bang for your yeah, buck. Yeah, because they're multi-joint compound lifts, you, it's going to require so much more output and, uh, and your body's going to have to work that much harder um, to, to produce, you know, strength for these types of lifts. And so the, the demand of those alone, um, it, it's going to move you so much further than a lot of these other exercises out there. Um, you know, that, that may be promoted a lot as like hypertrophy or like building muscle, um, really the, the most demanding, the largest signal you can produce through those, um, you know, barbell lifts where it's like, uh, you know, heavy emphasis on all these muscle groups having to work together. Totally. Uh, it, that's really what it's about. Well, when we, we also said that, you know, the manual burn is, is less important, but what's nice about building a routine that's around these compound lifts is you actually burn a ton of calories. So even though it's less of a priority uh, to burn a bunch of calories in your workout, now you're talking about a weight training uh, routine that actually rivals running and some of these circuit training classes you put somebody in a you know orange theory circuit class or you know somebody who just is running a circuit or athletic training with plyometrics and stuff and you give me somebody and i do a bunch of you know squats deadlifts overhead pressing bench press for an hour with like tight on my rest periods like being sticking to the actual true rest periods and going all the way through huh, you would be surprised how close the calorie burn is it you won't it won't be that crazy yeah. significant of a difference well the way i like to look at it like this just really simplify it like i could do a, a curl for my biceps and i'll build my biceps right and the biceps are you know a muscle on the top of my arm and it's kind of a small muscle or i could do a pull-up a pull-up is also working the biceps but it's also working all, all my back muscles right my lats my rhomboids there's a little bit of trapezius uh, activity so i'm working more muscles in that same period of time. You do three sets of curls, I do three sets of pull-ups. We both worked our biceps, but I also worked all this other stuff. And so it just become it's just an efficient, effective way to train to send the loudest muscle building signal. The other person doing just the curls would have to add other exercises to hit all those other muscles, right. which is fine if you want to spend a lot more volume. It does. It requires a lot more volume, but and then you run into, you know, this is more complex getting into the weeds, but you run into more adaptation issues. Is it too much volume? How much training am I doing? You know, strength training really is about sending the signal and then leaving it alone. It's like giving the body a reason to build muscle and then that's it because the yeah. the the what you get out of it is not while you do it. Unlike calorie burning type workouts like cardio, the value is in the cardio itself, um, unless you're trying to build endurance, which here we're talking about boosting metabolism. With When it comes to metabolism boosting, it doesn't happen in the workout with strength training. It happens after through the adaptation. And so these big compound lifts just do the most. I mean, how many exercises would it take, you know, single joint exercises would take to really have the same effect as a barbell squat? Yeah. I'd have to put together like five, five or six, yeah. six different exercises. Yeah, at least. At least. Calf, hamstring, quad, low back, yeah. upper back, you know, core. So, yeah, yeah. core. Like, yeah, no way. Right. So you want to basically what you want to do is you want to, your routine should be centered around these big compound lifts, getting strong at them. And then if you want to add other extra stuff, you could definitely do that. But again, the, the foundation should be building muscle and the foundation within that foundation should be these, these compound lifts. Well, and the, and the next point is to focus on getting strong in those lifts. That's the best metric for it's this. Just, I'm just get, get strong, get good at them. That's all I'm thinking about. I'm training this person. We're trying to, and that's what, what's crazy about this. When you think about it is you also got to picture this, this client, this client is really overweight. They've struggled with weight loss their whole life. They come to you and they're like, Adam, I just want to lose as much weight as I possibly can. Can you please help me? I've struggled my whole life. And I'm like, all right, we're going to get strong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a hard conversation. Yeah. It's a tough conversation to have with, with someone that's in that place. That's not how they're thinking. They're, they're thinking we got to burn this off. We got to melt this off. I got to sacrifice. I got to hold, got to cut back calories. And you're kind of like, no, you know what? I'm going to keep you fed and we're going to, we're going to get strong right now. Yep. Just, just trust me. That's what we want to do. But so, I mean, I just want to 
make that point that I, I understand uh, if if this resonates with you that you've struggled with weight loss in the past, you've yo-yoed back and forth and you can't seem to get to that goal weight or whatever you have. This is made this is the major mental hurdle piece right here. This part where it, it yeah, doesn't you don't see, think what does strength have to do with fat loss? Right. You don't realize that. But what strength what strength the reason why it's such an it's, incredible metric is if you get stronger, if you're getting stronger it, relatively consistently over time, you can pretty much guarantee that your metabolism is probably boosting at the same time. Yeah. It, it's one of those physical pursuits that as it improves, it probably means the metabolism boosting as well. This is not true of other physical pursuits. If you increase your flexibility or your stamina over time, that does not mean your metabolism is getting faster or hotter, right? But strength typically means that. So the best metric when it comes to boosting metabolism to measure, if you just use a single metric, is strength. Am I getting stronger? Yeah. Yes, I'm going in the it's right the direction. It's the best metric for uh, realizing that you have everything in the right direction in terms of like hormones being balanced, in terms of like recovery, um, and in terms of like you being able to have and see real progression because everything else uh, doesn't really work. Um, it, you know, if you have any of those components out of out of order, out of balance, you're not going to see a lot of strength gains as a result. Yeah. Well, it also goes hand in hand with the the next point, which is making sure that you you feed the body what it needs in order to to build this muscle. Yes, right? because if I ever see anybody fall short here. They, they figure it out. They're like, oh, okay, okay, I get it. We need to build the metabolism. We need to build some muscle. So we need to lift heavy. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. But then they actually struggle with the nutrition piece. They're still like, I was eating jack in the box. Also, I'm cutting all that out. Now they're eating chicken salads and they're like eating twice a day. So they and, cut their calories low. So yeah, so yeah. they reduce their calories and then they're not seeing the strength gains like we want to see inside the gym. And then I come back and I find out later on, it's like, oh, well, that's because you took our calories from 4,000 calories to 1,200 calories because you're afraid to eat when I need you to eat, you're not going to build tissue out of nowhere. You, you, yeah, those building materials aren't there. No, right. you have to fuel the body. So there's there's two things that are happening. One is the strength training is sending a signal to build muscle and build strength. Two, the way that you eat also sends a signal. And that signal can say, uh, we can build this muscle. We can afford to build this muscle. We can afford to have a fast metabolism because we have the food. Or it can say, you know, I know you're trying to get stronger, but we don't got enough calories. We don't got enough food. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to build muscle. We're not going to build strength. We're going to keep things as efficient as possible because the calories are too low. So you have to do both. You have to not only build strength and build muscle, but you also have to feed yourself at least enough to allow that to happen. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean you go crazy with your food intake, but you got to fuel those things, right? So if you send the signal to build muscle, imagine a bunch of workers, right? You got a bunch of workers and you're like, here's the instructions, build the house. And they're like, all right, where's the bricks? Oh, there's no bricks. Yeah. Can't build a house. So you got to provide the materials as well by feeding your body. Because if you cut your calories too low while strength training, um, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. There are conflicting signals and the boost in the metabolism that you're expecting, even though your strength training is just simply not going to happen. So feed your body to fuel muscle and strength. Um, and I think we can get a little deeper into that, right? Yeah. 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 So the next thing is to slowly increase calories as the body adapts. So we're feeding the body, so you may be wondering, well, what does that look like? How many calories? What, what, what am I going to do here? One of the best things to do is to first off figure out how many calories you're eating just to maintain your body weight. Um, easy way to do this is to track. So take your, your normal food intake over the next couple weeks, write it down or enter it into an app. They make wonderful, <clears throat> super convenient apps now. And once you figure out how many calories you're generally eating and you know to maintain your body weight, that's your starting point. Then you start the strength training, and then what you do is you slowly, very slowly, bump those calories up just a little bit. And I, at first, I like to not bump the calories. I like to wait for the strength things to happen a little bit, and then I bump the calories. But what I don't do is cut the calories with the strength training. I keep them the same at first, and then I start to bump them. Yeah, I normally don't have to do much of adjusting calorie-wise at first. It's really just kind of switching the macros when I find uh, when I do when I assess a diet first. Like, so let's take the example. I know I use an extreme analogy of somebody who's eating fast food all day, but typically there's there's uh, some uh, unhealthy or poor choices in our nutrition when we're when we're way overweight, right? So I literally look at their just their average caloric intake for a week. And then I just make sure that we're we're hitting protein targets and we're we're making better food choices, but we're keeping the calories about the same. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to cut. I don't really need to add anything quite yet. I'm just gonna say 
because what it, oh, I find almost always is they're they're lacking a macronutrient. We're not getting enough healthy fats. We're not getting enough protein. We're eating too much sugar. We're not Fiber's getting enough fiber. Like, yeah, yeah. we never eat vegetables. So there's always there's always a, a a handful of things that I know that they we could be adding to the diet or making better. And so I just simply go like, okay, let's keep your calories about the same. But then um, you know instead of this meal and this meal that you normally would do here, like I, I prefer you eat this this instead. So let's add this in here. Let's add that in there. Yeah. And and then just let and then watch watch how the body responds. And many times you will see the client get a little stronger, lean out a little bit, and you're not even having to adjust calories in any direction. What that yet. usually looks like is uh, I'm stronger in the gym, so I can, I'm, I'm lifting, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 pounds more on some of those big lifts that we talked about. My weight hasn't moved on the scale, but I do notice that my clothes are starting to fit differently. Now, when I would have clients, I could do body fat tests so I could tell them exactly what was happening. And usually what I would see during this initial period of time was uh, a, a transfer or a sh or a change in body composition, I should say, right? Body fat went down, muscle went up. And it usually is about the same. In other words, they gained two pounds of muscle, lost two pounds of body fat, something along those lines. So the scale hasn't changed, although we have more muscle, less body fat, meaning they have a faster metabolism, they're stronger, and they're smaller. This is another important point to make here is that muscle is dense in comparison to fat. It takes up something a little bit more than three-fourths the space that body fat will take up. So if you lost 15 pounds of body fat and replaced it with 15 pounds of muscle, you would weigh the same, but you would lose almost a quarter of the size right. on so your you body. you look significantly smaller, even though the scale said exactly the You'd same. You'd be smaller. And so what you should expect if you're not doing body fat tests and stuff is like, okay, I'm stronger. My weight's the same, but I feel different. My body feels tighter and my clothes fit a little differently. In men, it usually looks like a, a weight. The waist is a little looser. Um, in women, same thing. You also may notice as a woman that around the butt might feel a little tighter. Don't freak out. It's because your butt is probably building. And I want to say that because sometimes people freak out. Like, I yeah. thought you said I was going to get smaller. Well, the butt's a muscle. Mm -hmm. It tends to lift uh, and build a little bit. And then you may get comments. This was my favorite part. When clients would do this and they wouldn't change on the scale, uh, so their weight would stay the same for the first couple months, they come to me like, you know what's weird, Sal? People keep asking me how much weight I've lost. Do you guys ever have clients? Not only that, but I'm so glad you said this because this is an, an area that is really challenging also to overcome. You tell a client to increase calories, you tell them to focus on building strength, and not only maybe does the scale not move in the direction they want, but then they also start filling out their clothes and their clothes look tighter. But I promise it looks, it'll look better yeah. on you. And so that's the part that's really tough because we associate like where we're at, like if we look good or we don't look mm -hmm. good off sometimes how our clothes is fitting. Mm -hmm. And it's like you you get a girl who all of a sudden her thighs and her butt and her jeans is filling out and it's tighter and you she was asking you to lose weight and she might start right, freaking out. pull them all the way up. Yeah, but now her butt's sitting up two more inches and she has defined hamstrings you yeah. when she didn't have before yeah. coming in you. So it's like, so you have to understand there is this kind of sculpting process that happens yes. and it's a slow, gradual process. And just because the pants are fitting tighter doesn't necessarily mean you're going the wrong direction. In fact, that may mean you're doing incredible right now, especially if you can be objective and go, you know what, actually, if I compared this picture of me today versus the picture just two weeks ago, I know the scale is saying the same, or even I'm up two pounds, but you know, I do. I think I do look a little bit better here than I did two weeks ago. And you should be able to see that, especially in a two weeks time. I think. Oh yeah. I mean, I used to love it. Clients would come to me and say that they're like, well, oh, it's weird. People are asking me how much weight I've lost and I've only lost a pound on the scale. And it's really weird before I'd lose 10 pounds and nobody noticed I'm like, well, you look different. Your body is holding less body fat. It's got more muscle. Muscle looks very good. I mean, a, a 150 pound female at 20% body fat versus a 150 pound female at 32% body fat same height and everything, if you saw them stand next to each other, would look- Dramatically different. Dramatically yeah. different. You could do this with a 200 pound male as well. They would look dramatically different. So unless, your weight is important to some extent, but nobody walks around with a scale. Nobody really cares. It's really about how you feel, of course, how you look, your health, and body fat just takes up a lot of space. And, and you know, unless it's, when, once it gets past a certain point, it just doesn't look good. Muscle looks really good, it's tight and sculpted. And so in these initial stages of boosting metabolism, I want everybody, I want to be very clear, in the initial stages, you should expect to not lose any weight. You should expect to look and feel different, but you should not expect to lose any weight. You should expect to be stronger and start to see the initial effects of the metabolism boosting. Now, what would you say uh, the difference would be uh, between that and like a reverse diet where somebody's trying to come out of like a quote unquote broken metabolism or they went on this extreme 
diet, it's pretty much the same protocol, same protocol. to get back, right? It's the same protocol, and we would, in fact, uh, although we would keep the calories roughly the same to start with, we would reverse them mm -hmm. at some point, meaning slowly increase. That's what I, I mentioned earlier. You slowly increase the calories to fuel the metabolism. So someone may be wondering, how do I know when to stop? Like, when do I stop this reverse diet period? When do I, when do I start to really focus on the fat loss? Well, it's different from person to person, but typically I tell someone, when you get to the point where you feel like you're eating a lot of food mm -hmm. and you feel really good and you feel like you could cut your food and be okay. At that point, then we cut the calories, you've got the muscle, you've got the metabolism, and the fat loss happens. And I'll say this, I've seen this happen, I mean, a lot of times, many times. I would say at least half the times I've trained people where they'll lose 20, 30 pounds and at the end of the process, eat as much or more at the end of that weight loss process than they did going into it. You can't say that about traditional, just cutting the calories and trying to burn oh, calories. Oh, no, definitely. I yeah. remember, I did this even with somebody who's healthy and in shape. So this doesn't apply just to a broken metabolism or just someone trying to lose weight. I mean, I remember when I was training Melissa for her uh, bikini competition. Right. And when I first got her, I th her calories were around 1,800 or 1,900 to keep herself relatively, she looked great. She was in good shape. She wasn't bikini ready, but she was in good shape. And I said, I first want to, I want to ramp your metabolism up before we get into prep. So we trained for the three to four months before, and the goal was to just get her caloric and take as high as we possibly could, maintaining her you know, weight and body about where it's at so that when we decide to go into a cut, we have all this room. And what ended up happening was we ramped her all the way up to, I think, 27 or 2,100 calories. That's almost a thousand. So when she was in peak week, she was eating at what she was when I first got her. So think about that. And like, that's extreme dieting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah that was our that's on peak stage. week. Extreme, yeah. the, the lowest of low weeks and, and hardest for most people is that final week going to stage. And that's what she was eating on a normal week when I got a hold of her when we first started. So this, this idea and concept isn't only for someone who has a broken metabolism or someone who has yo-yo yeah. dieted back and forth or someone who just wants to lose 50 to 100 pounds. I mean, you could take this, this really for me, it's that, do you want more metabolic flexibility? Do you want the ability to have a burger and fries every once in a while and not feel like it sticks right to you, to feel like you can you can enjoy a night with a glass of wine and eating out and not feel like all that gets right. stuck to you? And so that's why, to your point, Sal, there is such a huge variant. And that's exactly how I ask clients. I go, well, where would you like to be? You know, I, I, it's not, it's not for me to decide just cause you are so tall and so, and you weigh so much that, oh, you should have a metabolism that burns X amount of calories. It's like, listen, if you feel very satisfied and you like the amount of calories you eat and it gives you some freedom to, you know, eat, eat out every once in a while and maintain your, then you're fine. But if you go, man, Adam, I feel like I, I can't get away with anything. And I, I eat yeah. so tight and clean. And if I eat one bad thing, well, if that's the case, then this is, this is for you. Even if you are considered a quote unquote fit person. Yes. Now the next point, and this has to do with nutrition also is to prioritize protein. So protein, number one, a high protein diet. When I say high protein, it's about 0.6 to a gram of protein per pound of body weight in normal weight individuals. So take your body weight and a little more than half your body weight up to your body weight in grams of protein is what you're aiming for. The higher amount tends to work better. So I said 0.6 to one, closer to one tends to work better uh, in my experience, but it builds more muscle, which boosts the metabolism. It also on its own has more of what's called a thermogenic, thermogenic effect, meaning a gram of protein actually burns more calories than a gram of carbs or a gram of fat. So protein also has this effect where it burns more calories on its It's nominal. It's not a huge effect, but over time it makes a difference. And then here's the third reason why I, I like prioritizing protein. It's very satiating. It's very, mm -hmm. very satiating. So when you're eating a high protein diet, especially at the end when you've lost the weight and everything, high protein tends to make you feel more satisfied, more balanced energy. You maintain more of the muscle. So when you're doing this kind of reverse diet process through through strength and in combined with strength training, prioritize protein. What does that look like? Every meal, make sure you eat the protein first. Figure out how much protein you need for the day. Divide it by your meals. Eat that first, then eat everything else, and the rest typically takes care of itself. I've, I find this even more important than the whole calorie thing, even though I understand that that uh, if we're in a deficit, we're going to lose. If we're in a surplus, we're going to gain, and that's that's, that's something we're not breaking the, those laws right of physics. But I definitely think that for the average person, just learning how to focus on hitting what your pro what your protein intake, your daily protein intake should be in order to build muscle that. That by itself and just yeah. focusing on it, it kind of takes care of a lot of things. It does. Like, if mm -hmm. it's whole foods, you'll typically yes. get the calories. It's hard to yeah. do. It really is. For for most people, 
it is hard to consistently get enough protein in day in and mm -hmm. day out to for the optimal amount, you know, so ideal amount of protein that you are to build muscle, consistently do that. And if you do that, I think I feel like the other things kind of take care of themselves. Well, it's so. interesting because it's so satiating, it's it's easier to like eat less, but but if you're not seeking protein, it's it because it's so satisfying, it's easy to not eat it if you're yeah. eating everything else with it, if that right. makes sense. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, no. But if you eat the protein first. You're going to build more muscle. You're going to get more of what you need, and you're going to feel better from a satiety standpoint, especially at the end when you finally do cut your calories after this process of, of boosting your metabolism. We, we say this a lot, and I want to add to this because I think this is important. Is that like it's to me? It's not only do you eat protein first, but it it has to be protein in there. In other words, like I, I brought up the other day when we were talking, had a similar conversation. And so let's say you, oh, the guys say eat protein first. They have their breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they always make sure to eat their protein in that order. But then they have these like snacks in between. Oh, grapes here and some almonds there. And like, and they, and it's like what ends up happening is they tend to mostly snack on carbs or fat, like an almond or what that. And you, you end up, hitting your calorie budget for the day and still don't hit your protein intake because your three small meals only mm. had 30 grams a piece, which is 90 total uh, grams of protein. And your body needs, let's say, let's for argument's sake, 180. And then you fill the rest of your calories up with the grapes, the almonds, and some yeah. what we would call healthy snacks. But because it, you weren't protein focused, you ended up still hitting your calorie intake and not getting enough protein. So it's like, Everything needs to be protein focused. If you're going to have a snack, then I'm thinking, okay, I need to get my what's my, a good protein, yeah, a snack? majority of protein first, and then I can have those almonds with it, or I can have those grapes with it, not them by themselves, or else what ends up happening is you kind of graze all day and you end up hitting your caloric intake, you can't do any more, and then you're short on protein. That's yeah. super common. Yep. All right. So this next one, this is probably the more controversial part of this, which is to use cardio for health during this period, but not for the calorie burn. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Well. Movement's good for you, and cardiovascular activity does have health benefits, and studies will show that the, the best health benefits you'll get out of exercise is a combination of strength training and cardiovascular training. Now, if you had to pick one over the other, strength training beats out cardio. We've done many episodes on this, but ideally, you want to do a little bit of both, um, and in this particular scenario with boosting metabolism, the focus should be strength training, and cardio should be kind of like this added part, and really just for health. And if, in, in ideally, if if we're doing it for health, it's walking. Really, it's about going for walks during the day. Now, if you want more stamina, you could push the stamina a little bit. But the problem with using cardio for the calorie burn is when I push cardio to burn calories, I'm telling my body to become more efficient with calories. I'm telling my body uh, I don't want a lot of muscle because I don't want a lot of burn a lot of calories. I want endurance. I don't need so much strength. And so what will happen is you'll get less of that muscle building. So if you're training to build muscle and you're also training hard to burn lots of calories with cardio, you'll get less muscle as a result of that and less of a metabolism It's boost. always walking for me unless the, the only ex exception to the rule for me is if that's a client who has some sort of a routine that they've always done. I'll give you an example. My brother-in-law is a diehard downhill mountain biker. He It's very intense, burns a ton of calories, very endurance, stamina-based, and he rides uh, twice on the weekends for so two days of these like three-hour rides. But he does that year round, nonstop. Doesn't matter if he's fat, skinny, on his workout program, not on his workout program. So it's a passion for yeah. Him. So I'm gonna I'm gonna build that. So so insert you know paddle boarding, insert running for an hour on the weekends, insert your favorite class. You always do like if it is something you love to do, regardless of your your body composition, and it's a passion for you. Or you know play pick up basketball you know, three times a week or like that, then I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to tell them they can't do that because that's something that they love to do. And then it's got other benefits just for besides calorie and even the health benefits of what it does for your heart. So those people, everybody else, if we're starting on this routine, I'm, I do not want any of that type of, all I want is walking. You feel like, you know, you normally wouldn't get out and you feel you're, you're you feel good on your diet and you're happy you're doing this new weight routine and you don't want to just sit around and watch TV. Okay. Go for a walk. Go for a hike. 
Go, yep. go move around. Go to a park. Go to a zoo. Go walk around for a while. I'm all for that. Don't go get on a treadmill yeah, and, general kick, activity. and kick ass for an hour because that is not going to help us in our pursuit, right? even though you may think that. Yeah, because that whole math thing's a trap, when you, especially when you start associating those calories with like a, a meal that you just had. Yes. And you start looking at how many calories you can then transfer over on the treadmill to sort of absolve you of those calories. That's just a, a war you're never going to win. Yeah, think of it this way. I'm going to oversimplify it. So I know it's not this simple, so everybody relax. But let, let, let's say you're looking at your, you're doing this and you're like, wow, my body now is burning 2,300 calories a day. If I just got on that treadmill and ran as hard as I could for an hour, I could make it like 2,600 calories a day. So that's what I'm going to do. And initially that's what'll happen. You'll burn an extra, whatever, 300 calories or so. But then what happens, your body starts to adapt towards stamina and endurance and it starts to slow its metabolism down. Eventually you're back down to burning 2,300 calories or less in the, with doing the extra running on the treadmill. So now you're doing more work to get the same or worse results. So if you want to boost your metabolism, don't do cardio for the calorie burn. Do it for health, which is totally fine, but don't worry about the calorie burn. Our goal is to boost your metabolism. Our goal is not to get you to burn more calories manually and do a lot more work. Remember, we're looking at sustainability. We're looking at fat loss forever, not just in the short term. Mm -hmm. All right, the last one, and this one's very important because um, – this could definitely throw a wrench in the whole machine, which is to prioritize good sleep. So poor sleep is a tremendous stress on the body. And just because of the way we evolved, when we were, when we were under chronic stress, it was probably due to the fact that we couldn't find calories. So the two types of stress that we'll typically encounter is acute. Something happened right now. Car almost hit me. It's gone. Oh, let me calm down now. The car, I'm safe. The other one's just kind of chronic stress, you know, stuff that kind of sticks with you and stays with you. Poor sleep wears on your body and it's chronic. It, it causes stress to happen throughout the day, changes hormone profiles. Um, it's just this chronic level of stress. And when you're, what your body tends to do under chronic stress is it tends to try to protect itself. And the way it protects itself is it says, hey, Let's burn less calories. Got to keep it safe. We don't know what could happen. Food might not be here. Hey, let's store more body fat. Hey, let's lower these hormones that tend to speed up the metabolism, like testosterone and growth hormone. Let's raise these other hormones that'll help us store more body fat and kind of give us temporary energy, things like cortisol. And let's, let's not have a faster metabolism. So good sleep is important because bad sleep will ruin everything that we just talked about. Yeah, I'm glad you added this one in the list um, because if there's ever somebody who I feel like is is doing all the things you're telling them and then they're still not seeing the results, this has been the culprit. Yes. Mm -hmm. They're like, I'm doing this, I'm dieting, I'm training this, that. And we're like, we're both like scratching our head. Because at this point, they haven't admitted to me like, I have terrible sleep at night yeah. or I stress all night long or I have this terror. Like that hadn't came up yet, right? We haven't, we're thinking about all the things we can, we can do about it. And this person is just piling more onto their already super stressful and non-sleeping nights that I'm not aware of at this point yet. And this is normally when this comes out. It's like, are you sure you're doing this? You're doing that? You're doing this? You're doing that? And then it's normally like, well, then how's your sleeping? Oh, well, that's fucked up. Yeah. I don't, you know, then yeah. you're like, oh, okay. Well, there, yeah, there might be never the fully recovered. I yeah. mean, your body's just never in that place. I used to have have, uh, clients this was like that one last piece that was actually turned out to be a massive piece in the whole puzzle like you know nutrition dialed like her workouts are on point everything but was getting woken up many times in the middle of the night uh for for phone calls and things overseas and it's just like battling that and carrying that same stress all day long it just affected uh, a snowball effect to everything else yeah and it, i mean it affects behaviors too it affects cravings it affects your moods yep uh, it affects muscle building. Yeah, it makes all the, it makes the other things all harder. Not yeah. only does it not help them and potentially hurt, hinder them, from <laughs> it'll make them impossible. It'll make yeah. it impossible. Yeah. I had a guy. I had a client once that, like you were saying, Adam was doing everything right. Finally, we tackled his sleep when we when he really took sleep seriously, and we really got. And it took us a little while. It took us a few months to really figure this out. He did a sleep study and worked with a doctor, and we figured it out. He lost, I mean, ten pounds of body fat and gained ten pounds of muscle. It was crazy. We were doing all the same stuff. Yeah. The only difference was he finally got a sleep down and it made such, and we, and I remember he was going to this doctor. They were also looking at his hormone, like mm -hmm. everything changed yeah. just from sleep. So I had to include this because if this is off, you could strength train with the best programs. You could eat great protein. You could have the right cardio for health. You could feed your body appropriately, do all the right stuff. This is going to, it'll just. Yeah, we cut all. the workouts in half uh, with, with my client after we had realized that was the biggest culprit. And then you just focus on sleep, and it was like this completely transformative thing, just unlocked. You know, and I, and I know it's sleep that we're pointing to right now, but I mean, I think that this could almost, 
include like your your overall just stress bucket. Sure. Right. So maybe you get okay sleep or it's not the worst sleep ever. And so you don't think that's a culprit, but then you have this like, you know, crazy marriage, you you hate your boss. Like you just got all this other stress going on in your life that a lot of times in, in my experience, when a, when a client is doing most, if not all the things you're telling them to do and their body still is not responding, a lot of times that is just, we are over, the body is just feeling attacked from all. You got to remember that even this working out and dieting stuff is a stress on the body. Well, yep. So if, if your bucket was already full when you came to me and then I added to it, even if it's things that are quote unquote healthy for you, right? Exercise, right? Eating better. It, it will sometimes completely stall your progress because your body is just is too overwhelmed and reducing and cutting back on a lot of things is actually the simplest thing. Well, think of it this way, right? If you, um, if you, if the economy looks like it's going terrible, what are people going to do? Save their money, not spend a lot, cut their bills, right? It's what your body does with calories. If it starts to feel lots of stress, it'll try to save calories, right? It'll try to store more of them and it'll reduce how many calories you put out. So it'll actually slow your metabolism down. In fact, losing sleep is one of the fastest way to slow your metabolism down. So it's a very important one. Why is muscle soreness and calorie calories burned not a good cue on effective exercises? What do you suggest we track? Oh, so that's good. Okay, so calories burned is okay to track uh, total for the day. But really, one of the reasons why we don't tell people to judge workouts by, by the calories burned. So in other words... What we often say is, look, the calories you burn during a workout, that really doesn't, don't worry about that. In other words, that's not how you should rank your workouts because what people tend to do is say, oh, this is a higher calorie burning workout, therefore it's better for fat burning. The problem with that is it ignores the adaptations that the exercise induces and it's the adaptations that make the biggest impact. For example, if you lift weights, you're not going to burn nearly as many calories as if you do lots of long distance running. Long distance running burns far more calories. But when it comes to long-term fat loss, lifting weights is more effective because it tends to speed up the metabolism. It builds muscle and it teaches your body to burn more calories on its own. So that's that. Now, as far as soreness is concerned, <clears throat> I get where people can say, oh, because I'm sore, that means my workout was effective. But the truth is soreness, if it tells you anything, it tells you you did too much. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't say much more than that. And in the best results I've ever had with myself and with clients through my two decades of training was when I would get to a place where clients didn't get sore at all, or maybe like a tiny bit of soreness where they'd have to search for the soreness. They'd have to stretch and kind of, oh, like, I think I, I feel a little sore. Feeling really sore usually meant, or almost always meant they did too much, and it would typically precede worse results or injury. I would make the same case for calories burned. Mm. As as a as a metric for the workout, yeah. all that means is you made the workout hard, and making it an doesn't mean it's effective. Yeah, making an exercise hard is not necessarily what makes it effective. So I, I don't I think it's a terrible way. Now I do I do like and I do think that there's value in tracking the total calories you burn in a day, so you have an idea of your intake and what that right. balance should look like. Like oh today my body is burning a total of, you know, 3000 calories. So I shouldn't eat more than 3000 calories if my goal is to lose weight, right? So I think understanding your total caloric burn in the day uh, matters. And by the way, the the workout will be such a small fraction of what the total the total burn number would yeah, be. Yeah, that's true. And and also even the best calorie trackers um aren't sophisticated enough to really pick up your how your metabolism is changing. Um, they, they have maybe a 10% error rate with a lot of things, sometimes more. That's a lot. I mean, 10% is 200, 300 calories. That can make or break. And if you build a little bit of muscle or just teach your body to burn more calories, you're not necessarily going to pick that up with a calorie tracker. You will pick it up if you're tracking your calories uh, consumed and notice that, oh, wow, I'm losing weight faster than before, or I'm hungrier, or I'm stronger. So I, I, I could see it being a tool but when people rest everything on it is when you start to get into problems. Yeah, the soreness thing is is flawed. I mean, if you if you're always going into like your next workout sore and and it, it's going to impede on your performance for one, but uh like it it is an indication that you you overstretched a bit. I mean, even if it's a novelty factor, right? So even if you're initially getting back into working out, you're going to have that phase where you're going to go through I'm sore because like I'm reintroducing this type of stress to my body. Um but you really 
it, now kind of looking back at that and, and having more maturity in the way that I approach fitness, it's like you, you really need to like do even less than that coming back uh, to be able to build upon that and actually, uh, you know, get the desired adaptation uh, instead of just uh, getting that in- immediate feedback that I did work like uh, that's all it indicates to me is i did a lot of work yeah uh and, and i'm healing from that work not necessarily what i need to be focused on is do i feel stronger do i feel more energetic do i feel um you know a sense of progress going forward not necessarily do i feel like that that workout uh led to me uh feeling like i i had to make it through like i was i, I barreled through so it. I'm, I'm measuring strength technique maybe circumference maybe a picture like th- those are things that I'm using uh, as an indicator of is my workouts and my programming effective and good. Yeah, like it, I'm, I'm going to look at those things. Well, more let me than ask I'm, you guys. Look at you guys are very good at. Obviously, you guys know what you're doing when it comes to writing workouts. How hard or easy is it to write a workout that'll make someone sore? Easy. Does it yeah, require any easy. skill whatsoever? None. No. You don't need any workout. In fact, you don't need a, a program. If you just want to get sore, There's go to the gym. There's brands out there that do And you just want to burn a lot of calories. Yeah, go to the gym, move like crazy, do something that's really, really hard, stress the shit out of yourself. And I promise you, I promise you, you'll see a little bit of results and you'll plateau real hard, either injure yourself or start to go backwards. Yeah. If it was as easy as getting sore, every new fitness fad would, would solve obesity. It doesn't because that's not how it works. And worshiping the soreness and pain leads to a bad relationship with exercise anyway. Even if it were a great way to judge uh, your workouts, no. You if you want to if you want to take all different kind of workouts and exercise types and rank them in terms of effectiveness, rank them on the adaptations they induce in the body, not on the perceived challenge of doing them, not on the soreness or the calories burned while doing them. That means very little. And you said something, Adam, about the calories burned during a workout. How it's almost inconsequential. It is. Like you do an hour intense exercise. What are you going to burn? 400 calories if you're lucky? Yeah. 400 extra calories. So you work out three days a week. Okay. 1200 calories a week. Do the math over the course of the week. What is that per day? Yes. Right. That's almost nothing. Yeah. You could eat. I could eat 1200 calories up, you, in 10 you, minutes. You can get up an extra hour earlier on the weekends, go for a, wike, a, a hike yeah. or a walk after all your meals and you'll, it will end up adding up to be more than your, right. your hard workout is. So it's so much more effective to focus on that from your intake of food because it's a lot easier to manage it that way. Totally. Yeah. Next question is from Jay Pliu. What are your opinions on sugar versus sugar substitutes? Okay, you know what's interesting about this is uh, obviously sugar is carbohydrates, right? So every gram of sugar is four calories. And so the theory is, well, if we cut sugar out of people's diets or have them replace their sugar uh, consumption with a sugar substitute that has no calories, we should see weight loss. We should see improvements in health. We should see people solving some of their health issues because they've cut their calories, right? Now, in controlled environments, when we take people and we have them count every calorie and they replace sugar with sugar substitutes, they do cut their calories, they do see weight loss. But in other studies, real world studies, not where people are in a controlled environment where everything's counted, when people are just like, yeah, I have you know two sodas a day, and then scientists say, cool, replace those with a diet soda, and then we'll track and see what happens. No weight loss. Mm-mm. There's no success. It's actually terrible success a, a track record in the real world. It hasn't done anything to help with the obesity epidemic at all. And lots of very obese people have lots of sugar substitutes. Why is that? Because it promotes behaviors that lead to overeating. It also eliminates a barrier between you and consumption. Whereas when I'm going to go have a sugar-filled soda, I know I'm about to consume 200 calories. If it's a zero calorie soda, I tend to be like, oh, cool, there's no consequences. Yeah, I'm going to keep drinking inert. this. Yeah. And that perception of sweetness can change behaviors. It, and it, what it does, it tends to make people eat more food. So my opinion is this. If you're someone who tracks everything all the time, then, then yeah, there could be some benefit there uh, with body composition. But for everyone else, this is zero, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna help you at all. Replacing your soda with sugar-free soda and not tracking everything else, it's just going to result in this again. All the studies show this. It just results in eating more calories elsewhere. It was, doesn't help. Was that study that you bring up every now and then concerning that? Was it two to five hundred calorie increase? Five hundred, five hundred per day. Oh, you're talking about heavily processed food consumption. Yeah, just yeah. in terms of it leading towards like behaviors in that direction and and like the cravings. It's just like 
Uh, I mean, in terms of like your your body's perception of of flavor and sweetness and taste, like you're still um, seeking that out if, if that's still being something that's introduced. And a lot of times too, for me, uh, the um, the artificial version it's so much sweeter, and it's like it it, it almost um, it you know anything else besides that it seems like less less than and so i tended to to gravitate more towards these sweet uh food items yeah i probably out of all of us i probably use the most sugar substitutes i mean i'm drinking a zero calorie zevia right right now, right so i probably utilize the most and i think a lot of those behaviors came from my competing days of like tracking uh and like going hey i want something sweet and i can't have any calories and so i'm gonna have something like that um but i'm not fooled by uh the behaviors that come with that. Like I'm very aware that when I drink zero calorie drinks, I have a, a tendency to want to have two, three, four in a day of it. Mm -hmm. And then, then I, then I have cravings for other foods. I do notice those behaviors versus if I say like, there's been times where I'm, I don't have an option for a calorie free and I have to drink a regular Coke or a regular Pepsi and I'm craving a soda or a drink and I'll have it. And what I won't have a second or a third yeah. or a fourth because I'm very aware of the calorie content in there. So yeah, I don't, I don't have much of a dog in this fight as far as, uh, of like, am I fro am I for them? Am I against them? I think I have more of a neutral relationship with them, but it, like everything else, I mean, I just shared recently on the podcast that I took a fast from, you know, sex and weed and food. And really for me, like that part of that practice, and I do that with things like soda, even though I don't announce it every time I do it, is just like, I never want to be dependent or feel like I have to have anything. And I do feel that uh, those, uh, those addictive properties from these zero calorie type drinks, it's very hard for me to kick the rock star thing. It's very hard for me to kick the Zevia drink every single day thing. And I'm, I'm aware of it. Like, mm -hmm. and I'd never want anything to have control of me like that. So I do allow it to creep in my life, but I also pay attention to my own behaviors on, am I allowing myself to have one a day or one every other day, or am I having two, three, four, five in a day? And it, it, it easily can creep up to that. And yeah. I, I kind of get set these boundaries with myself of like, okay, I can enjoy those things. But if I start noticing where I, I I'm wanting one, two, three, multiple in a day, like it's time for me well, the, to peel back. Well, I remember when I first became a trainer. So I, I grew up, we almost never had soda. And we definitely never had diet soda as a kid. So I just didn't grow up with it, right? So I, I wasn't, you know, I had them here and there. We'd go eat, you know, if we'd go out to eat or something, I'd have some, but it wasn't a big deal. And then I became a trainer. And I remember some strange behaviors from clients that I would see repeated. Like I'd have clients that would drink Diet Coke mm -hmm. and they would drink a lot of Diet Cokes. I'd have clients that didn't drink water. I had a lot of clients who were like, I don't like water. I don't like the taste of it. I'm like, what? You don't like the, wa the taste of water? No, what you're bringing up yeah. right now is a very good thing that I've connected to my own behaviors. So what I easily can do, I did this one day in in, in Hawaii. I'm in Hawaii, so I kind of let the like, yeah. I'm not I'm not restricting anything. I'm just going to enjoy. And what happens when I am have that attitude is I easily can have carbonated zero calorie drinks all day and no fucking water. Mm -hmm. And then I get a headache or I don't, and I go and I go, oh shit, like I haven't had like, just water today at all. Well, I remember I, I would and and I would have clients say things like, um, "I don't like the taste of regular soda. I like I like uh, sugar free better." And then I did research. I'm like, "Oh, it's sweeter. It hits the the sweet receptors a little differently. It can make actual sugar taste more bland. That's interesting." And I also remember using um, you know sugar free substitutes in meal plans. This is early in the day, back in the day when I create clients meal plans, where I try and tell them, "Here, just replace your sodas with this. This will make you lose weight." It never worked. Did you guys ever have clients besides bodybuilders and, and competitors who would track every single That's thing? That's it. Those are the only people that I ever had success utilizing things that were sweetened with artificial sweeteners. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, did, did you get any clients where like, oh my God, this was a game changer. It totally helped me lose yeah, weight. All I needed to do was switch to diet soda and yeah, I lost all this weight. <laughs> no, <laughs> never. No, so many addicted to Diet Coke though. I, I wonder, like in terms of that product, you know, for them. Like if it, if it at any time, like met the same amount of uh, revenue they're bringing in from just regular Coke, because it was like, Oh, actually, so prevalent. I would love to see that stat. I, so I prefer Diet Coke. You'll never yeah. catch me drinking a regular. Coke. I feel like they, yeah, they probably I, I kept a little Diet bit Coke. of the Coca leaf formula still in there. I, it's so well, I, I think I Sal, they make Sal, more money. Sal's, I would actually, I would love to, I bet they do. That's a great stat to pull up. Doug. I would love to see Diet Coke versus Coke as far as revenue. sales. Yeah. Revenue is concerned. I bet Diet Coke rivals it. Um, mm. It's overtaken, classic Coca-Cola. Overtaken, wow. Yep. 
Well, what it is is you have you have a so com- brilliant. You have Crazy. a combination of things that are making this just a perfect storm. One, you have this signal that says no calories, no sugar. So you've got that. Yeah. Number two, Coke has caffeine in it. Caffeine's got addictive properties. Where do you know that? So that's there. And number three, it's hyper palatable. And Diet Coke is sweeter than regular Coke. Yeah. Aspartame, which is the sweetener they use. Is so much sweeter than normal sugar. They use a tiny, tiny amount, and even the amount that they use, it's powerful. It hits the sweet, re- the, the, the receptors that perceive sweetness harder, which is why people who love diet sodas feel like they don't like the taste of regular soda. Which I used to think right. was really weird when I was a kid. This yeah. was like so, that joke. Too. That's me. I, I work in a restaurant, and um, you know, you get this group of like big people coming in, ordering like every fried food yep. and like disgusting, you know, like huge calorie bomb. And then like, Oh, but diet Coke. Yep. You know what you're saying? <laughs> Why? Yeah, like, yeah. honestly, like, what are we doing? It's here? because, because they like it better. Actually. I mean, that's, I, you yes. know, if I, if I were to, even though I can't remember the last Some of them time just I, I went through though, as a calorie thing. Yeah. That's stupid. Hilarious. That's afterwards. Yeah. yeah. What the, the driving factor was the taste. Sure. Yeah. 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 So the, the problem I prefer, is I prefer it. So you would, ca- so someone would say that about me. Like you'd see me go through, even though yeah, I've been through a McDonald's drive through in decades, but if I were to go through a McDonald's drive thru I would be a diet coke. I'd be a diet coke. I would I would I would ask for. They sell sure. more. I mean, Doug even pull up. I so really what this is and this is just really uh, occurring to me. This is a perfect example of the divorce between behaviors and the me- mechanistic ac- aspects of obesity. So we look at obesity, yeah. we go, oh, it's too many calories. Let's just cut the calories and give everybody the other stuff that comes along with the calories and we should solve the problem. You didn't solve the problem. Right. They're still consuming math. They're yeah. still consuming something that's hyper sweet and, and encouraging behaviors that lead to obesity. And that's why it has done nothing to solve the obesity epidemic. Next question is from Seth Bruce 96. What stabilizer muscle exercises do you recommend to help arms stop shaking when bench pressing? Oh, man. So, so do you guys, whenever you king, this doesn't happen. Shoulder, to me. This is more shoulder than it is arm. It is, but, but. This hasn't happened to me in a long time, but as a kid, when I would have to take breaks from workouts, I remember I'd go back to this. This is because you never take breaks. This I happens to me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's because you never take breaks yeah. ever. Well, this happens to me all the time. If I take shaky, right? Yeah. If yeah. I take two weeks off of lifting and I come back to like a movement and like bench press. It, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, fir- the first day is, so it's very normal yeah. to feel this. For it's someone like you who never misses. Nervous system kind of reacts. You have to go back right? to your teenage years, but yeah. this happens to me all the time. Whenever I, I, I fall off for two weeks and I haven't trained consistently, I go back and yeah, you're, it's, you're CNS and that's, that's it. it. It's super normal. And it's like, I mean, can you do some stuff to like help stay? And I, I said shoulders, right? It's not your arms. It's your your shoulders staying in position and staying in that fixed position, yep. stabilizing while mm-hmm. the arms, but the arms are shaking, but they're shaking because the shoulders are are trying to trying to get stabilized. So you could do some primers. Yeah, prime. Yeah. yeah, priming the shoulders and the shoulder girdle really well. That probably would mitigate some of that, but part of it's just going to happen. Yeah. And, and, and you'll and, adapt quickly. And the priming, so a good example is this, if you've ever experience this, you know that after the sec- first or second set, the shakiness goes away. Yep. All of a sudden, the, the rep becomes smooth. And it is. It's the CNS. The CNS has to organize the muscles and fire them in smooth, efficient ways. And when you don't train for a while or you're just getting started, it has to learn this. The CNS has to learn how to fire muscles properly while moving this weight in this particular way, keeping things smooth and efficient. Mm-hmm. And so it feels like your muscles are laughing almost or they're kind of shaky. And you see this more common with some exercises than others. The best way to get rid of it is to practice the exercise often and mm-hmm. to slow down the reps. That's really the only way to do it. And if you want to get rid of it in that same workout, it usually takes a set or two. As the muscles, as your because your CNS adapts that fast. It adapts that fast to where within the same workout, you should be able to get everything to push a little smoother. It's so funny because, like, for example, like I, I know Ben Pollock kind of – like he's a really strong guy, right? And he's been doing every kind of powerlifting movement like uh, – um, loaded, you know, um, not doing like no unilateral stuff. And then all of a sudden went to like lunges, for instance. Oh, yeah, yeah he like was all to, wobbly. Yeah, but it just happens to the best of us is my point. Yeah, yeah. Um, to where like you introduce something that's um, a little bit different and the body has to react completely uh, to it in a, in a different fashion. It's going to take that bit of time for your body to really acclimate to that. No, that's a great that's a great analogy or example because in a, in unilateral movements it requires more stabilizer muscles because you don't have the other mm-hmm. the other arm or other leg in it to stabilize. 
So, yeah, I think that's a great example, and that's what's happening right now, and you just gave a good example of someone who is unbelievably conditioned, trained, strong as shit, but all he had to do was go from you know squatting six, 700 pounds, which he can do, to doing a body weight lunge, and he was shaky, and it's not because he's weak. It's just that, that he has that those stabilizer muscles required to stabilize in a lunge position is very different than being able to squat yes. bilaterally. It's and not so, a muscle thing. It's a CNS thing. Yep. Yep. I remember years ago, God, I'll never forget this. There was this bodybuilder, big guy. I don't know how much he weighed, but if I had to guess, he's probably 240 pounds, shredded, big dude. And then there was a weightlifter. It was a small guy, about 150 pounds. And, and the weightlifter was overhead pressing. I don't remember what the weight was, but it was a lot of weight to the point where all of us were kind of impressed. Doing a standing overhead press, right? Everybody was really impressed. So the bodybuilder goes over to try it out. And the bodybuilder could lift the same weight, but it didn't look the same. He looked shaky, and you could tell he was kind of muscling it and not really stable. And then afterwards, they were talking, and he's like, yeah, I'm just I'm not used to that movement. And the weightlifter's like, I, I practice this all the time. It's part of my lifts. The bodybuilder's like, I do this seated. I do this with dumbbells. I get pumps in my muscles. And it's just the bodybuilder had bigger, stronger muscles in the sense that those muscles probably contracted harder than that 150-pound weightlifter. But they couldn't organize the mm -hmm. same way. They yeah. couldn't fire with the same efficiency. And that's why he, he had trouble lifting the same weight. There's three types of muscle contractions. There's the lifting of a weight. So if I'm doing a curl, I'm lifting it. That's called a concentric muscle uh, contraction. When I lower the weight with control, that's also a contraction. That's called eccentric. Holding a weight would be isometric. So isometric contractions, you don't move. Yeah, it's immovable. If someone's doing an isometric exercise, they're not doing a rep. They're, they're, I mean, they're doing a rep in the sense that they're timing themselves, but they're not moving, okay? That's what makes them so safe. That's why you could do this on people who are recovering from injury yeah, or total beginners. Stage. Also, simultaneously, nothing has been shown to activate more muscle fibers than a maximal exertion isometric, which is also why it simultaneously is so valuable for advanced lifters. So when you're activating muscle fibers, the more muscle fibers you can activate, theoretically, the more muscle strength and growth you can, you can trigger. Because if you have... Let's say you have 100 muscle fibers. There's a lot more than that in a muscle, but let's say there's 100 of them and you only activate 80, then you're only going to signal 80 muscle fibers to grow and get stronger. If you can activate 100 of them, all of them, then you're going to get a you know 20% more muscle fiber growth because you're activating more of them. Well, isn't isn't isometrics the only way to get a full 100 potential? Yeah, or I mean, it's, it's the most effective way. I mean, you could probably do it if you're advanced and you're going like hardcore, like exerting yourself, but... With an isometric, because, and there's certain types of isometrics that do this, when you're pushing against an immovable object, which we'll get to uh, in the episode as a form of isometrics, because you're pushing and it's not moving and you're using maximal force, your body recruits more and more muscle fibers because it's not moving. Yeah. So it's like your body calls upon so many, uh oh, it's not moving, call more, uh oh, it's not moving, use them all. So it activates all the muscle fibers. Other muscle contractions don't necessarily do this. Well, and it's interesting if you go like per joint, like around where the muscle is being contracted, there's a 10 degree carryover of this, of this contractibility. So there's, you get strength um, that actually like carries over even further in terms of like in range or a little bit further past where, you know, that, that actual movement is getting its maximal exertion. Yeah. So to be, so to, to emphasize that. So if I do an isometric in this position, 15 here with degrees, my arm, sorry, I say 10, 50, yeah, yeah. 50, so it's 10 to 15, I think yeah. some, I think some studies will say even as much as 20. But let's say I'm holding uh, the cut and contraction here. So this is where I'm getting the isometric uh, contraction. First off, one thing about isometric size cool is I can train a specific part of the muscle contraction. So if you're doing an exercise and you notice there's a part of the rep that you're just weaker than the others, I could do isometrics in that part of the rep and get stronger in that part of the rep, thus making me stronger in the entire full rep or full range of motion. But what Justin's saying, which is also cool, is it's not just in that point. It's also about 15 degrees above and below that. So if it's here for me with the bicep squeeze and I get stronger here, I'm also stronger here and here. So there's carryover, meaning you don't have to do every single point of a, of a contraction to get the full strength along the full range of motion because there's a 15 degree carryover up or down. Yeah. One other like little fun fact before we get into like the actual workout programming and all that too, like that it's used a lot in therapy as well because of the analgesic effects. So 
there's you actually get pain relief because a lot of times there's a weakness and instability uh, that's not being addressed properly. So now if you spend the time to isometrically push and squeeze and and maximize the recruitment potential, it actually like sends a feedback back that this is secure. Now it actually relieves that that actual pain signal, and which is, is the si- which is the science behind why people that have followed our Prime Pro program or walk through the webinar totally. that we've done and they feel amazing. Amazing afterwards, right like afterwards. All, right afterwards, it's an like, immediate response. Oh my god, it's my great. hips feel better. Yeah. Oh my god, my low back feels better because of that reason, right there. Hundred percent. You know, another thing that's a, a, a neat point too is you talk about the three different types of contractions, and what I think is really interesting, even in advanced lifters, people lifting a long time, there's huge opportunity to improve the eccentric portion and also the isometric portion mm-hmm. because they're the like two most neglected. Like everybody yeah. thinks about lifting the weight up or moving the weight. I've I've brought it up on the show before. I don't think I ever walked into a gym and saw more than one or two people actually doing a true four second eccentric, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, negative in their in their uh, exercise they're doing, and then never see anybody doing isometrics. And so, if you're listening to this and you've been lifting for a really long time and you haven't put any sort of focus in those two years, huge opportunity. Huge. All yeah. right. So let's talk about the three main types of isometrics. Uh, the first one, which would be the most advanced and most intense type of isometric would be against an immovable object. So that means you're taking an object and you're applying maximal force to it. It's not moving. So the contraction is an isometric. So this would be like me getting underneath a bench press, but the bar is loaded so heavy that I can't possibly lift it. Or I have it pushed up against the safeties in the cage, for example. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing as hard as I can. The bar is not moving. I'm using external, uh, something externally to generate force or for me to generate force against. Mm -hmm. That's uh, an immovable object. That is very advanced. That's not a way that I would apply isometrics to a beginner or somebody who's got an injury or someone who we're trying to. So extrinsic force. Extrinsic force. But for an advanced lifter, holy cow. Like do this, uh, and we'll talk about when you could do stuff like this, but do this in a workout and watch how the rest of the workout feels or watch how it feels uh, at the end of the workout. Well, you see this uh, in like power lifters use this strategy a lot with like f- sticking points, mm-hmm. right? On their bench press or their deadlift, they'll they'll set the rack up to a point where they know like, man, anytime I get to my max weight, I fail right here. And so they'll set the rack up to where that failing point is and then they'll create this isometric contraction yeah. right here to help break through that plateau. Yeah, one thing you could do too, if you have a home gym, which is, this is really cool. I have yet to see anybody... I've seen a few people do this, but a lot of people haven't done this. And this is just phenomenal is you could take, if you have a home gym, you could bolt two hooks into the concrete that are just stuck, Hmm. have a couple chains uh, attached to either end and then put collars on the chains now. And the change could be long. So you could use a short part of the chain, long part of the chain. Now you could put a barbell underneath that and you could, Bench against an immovable mm-hmm. object, row, overhead press, whole squat, host of deadlift. Movements you can do that. I mean, anything you want, curl, and it doesn't move. And uh, like I said earlier in the episode, you'll activate all your muscle fibers, uh, or definitely more than you would with other exercise. But again, this is an advanced yeah. type of isometrics. This one will fatigue you and can get you sore. Yeah, this was also one of those kind of secret weapons for um, a lot of those combines, I, I noticed some of the guys had learned the, the, the ability how to uh, apply that type of like extrinsic force in, a, in an isometric um, before they would go to try and PR a lift or do something yes. in that regard. And, and it is an advanced technique, but it's very effective because to be able to you know prep your body ahead of time to to prime that amount of and generate that amount of force. Uh, when you go now to lift the weight, it's amazing uh, that your body just, you know, already has been prepped uh, to, to be able to, to, to access that. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're really turning on the CNS uh, with something like this. All right. The next one, this one is what you talked about just now, Adam, with power lifters is just holding a position with resistance. So this is not me pushing against an immovable object, but rather me using a weight, putting it in a position where I have to support it and then holding it there. So it'd be like doing a squat, going down to the bottom of a squat, and then holding that bottom position for 10 or 15 seconds, and then coming up. This one is probably most commonly used with strength athletes where they're trying to work on a sticking point where like, you know, maybe two inches off the ground, their deadlift gets stuck. 
Mm -hmm. or when they bench press, it's the lockout yep. or the bottom position. The bottom position, you just hold, and then we push and kill all momentum. Yes. yes. Now, what what is happening different in the body with the immovable object versus weight that's resisting it? Is it not getting the same CNS response as and recruitment response, or would it be the same? So similar, but you're going to activate more muscle fibers when you're pushing against an immovable object. Because when you're holding something, you're not pushing as hard as you can. Otherwise, you'd move the weight. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to hold. There's value there. The value is that you're strengthening a position in that rep, and it's not as damaging. Pushing against an immovable object, like go try squatting against something that doesn't move. Yeah. And the rate, of, the risk of injury is higher, and it'll fry your body more than holding than holding yeah, a weight. Intrinsically, well. you're really like you're you're bracing a lot more, and so you're stabilizing your whole body within that position versus like you know pressing all of that energy outward. And so you don't have as much emphasis on like the stability of your joints and your spine. So would you think, okay, so one is you're, you're resisting the weight more. The other one, you're actually you're exerting, trying to move it. exerting everything uh -huh. against something that it's can't all output. Move. It's like less on the, um, the input. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the one where you're pushing against an immovable object, that one definitely can, can sap your, it almost recovery. sounds like one of them obtains more, eccentric like uh, benefits and then the other one it, it obtains more concentric like benefits. I would think the immovable object you are trying to contract as hard as you yeah, possibly yeah. can. Yes. If you've got a barbell that's got 300 pounds on it you can't bench that, yeah. you're resisting that coming down yeah. more than you're contracting. Yeah, that's so, interesting. Yeah, so a, I, I wonder if there's any that's studies a valid, uh, yeah, it's a valid that point. would show that w doing one of the other tips more towards uh, similar benefits as the concentric versus the eccentric. So I would use the immovable object and that one would supplement a set for me because it's so it, 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 you exert so much energy with it. Mm -hmm. The holding a position, I can add that to my sets, and I'm not really adding. I mean, as long as I adjust the weight, right? I'm not really adding to the recovery load. So I can do, and I do this in my workouts all the time. I pause reps all the time with certain exercises, and it doesn't really hammer me uh, or or take away from my recovery. If I do an immovable object type rep. That's a set. Like I'm, I'm, I know I have to take away another set in order to add that because it's going to fry my body. So in, in terms of intensity, the immovable object type of uh, isometric is just takes taxes the body much more than holding the position. The third type of isometric has the least produces the least damage on the body. It's it doesn't require lots of recovery. This actually can facilitate recovery. This type of contraction. And this one's the most appropriate for correctional exercise. And this is where you're just trying to create internal and intrinsic isometric contraction. So this would be like flexing, right? Or posing or correctional type movements like you find in Prime Pro. Prime Pro is full mm -hmm. of this kind of stuff where I'm in a 90-90 and I'm trying to hold my leg up in a position. I'm not pushing against something. I'm not resisting something necessarily, but I'm just trying to activate. I'm just trying. So this was like correctional where it's like, I can't fire my mid back. Um, my shoulder blade rises too much when I do an overhead press or whatever. This is more like I'm doing it without resistance, except for the resistance I create myself. Right. My so body. it's more grav. Well, it's more body weight, the driven, yeah. right? So it's like, yeah. And you do, you use this a lot in mobility technique. And, and so there's, there's some, um, I guess, confusion because you are there's some mo actual movements that are happening while simultaneously you have to brace and hold your body in position which could be considered isometric uh, while you're going through certain movements so um, and this is something that's really important to train uh, which applies to your big compound list because to be able to keep your body uh, from shifting and, and from twisting and rotating at yeah. all is is a massive uh, consideration because that's usually a lot of times where we get into these problematic areas where injuries occur and, and where stress uh, gets directed to, to the joint. What would be an example way. of that? What, what's an exercise that would be an example of what you're describing right now? What, what comes to mind right away? Oh, so. if I'm talking about like something that I'm doing for a mobility drill. Yeah. So yeah. if I'm like, doing, like if I'm trying to uh, say just a 
like a simple wall circle yeah. and I'm, and I'm using my, my shoulder uh, is the directed point where of rotation where I'm trying to keep uh, my arm locked out. I'm trying to keep my shoulder from rotating with it to make it easier yeah. and my hips from rotating because my, my natural tendency is to want to kind of turn towards the rotation Got it. and to be able to brace and keep everything completely yeah. straight. So it's like controlling uh, the rest of my body in the kinetic chain, not and, and being able to isolate a joint so it can move freely. Yeah. Another example would be like a uh, like a lizard with rotation, and when I'm at the end range of that, and I'm trying to activate that, yeah, that, that full, full ro ro rotation while I'm trying to keep everything else very neutral. Yeah. Now, now, uh, interesting, right? So this this last type of isometric contraction you find in map symmetry in the first two weeks. Uh, a, a lot of what we do in the first two weeks is is similar to this. Um, and a, now we talk about map symmetry as being this like unilateral training exercise balances right and left creates a symmetrical looking body helps bring up weaknesses, but the first two weeks is isometrics. And you might wonder well, why are there isometrics in there? Because isometrics are a great way to balance out strength output to give, uh, the body, the range of motion it needs on both sides and essentially to activate and wake things up. So when you're trying to train unilaterally, you're probably gonna have one side that's stronger than the other. Doing a week or two of isometrics in the beginning is going to help you when you do your your unilateral training because it's going to wake things up and give you that form that you need. Otherwise, it's so yeah. far off. Well, it's going to provide control yes. and stability. That's right. Which is something that you need to consider that, especially once we start uh, unilateral training because the 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 – tendency to rotate and to compensate uh, gets heightened when you just work on one side of the body. That's well, right. and, and even simpler way I think to communicate it would be when you do bilateral stuff, both feet on the ground or like a, a bench press, both arms like that, most everybody has one side that is more dominant than the other. One of the main reasons why we all have that is there's better communication to one side than the other side. Right. When you do this, this first phase in isometrics is we are working on that communication. We are working on your ability to communicate to the weaker side, and we're, we're isolating that one side so you can really focus on that communication. And then build muscle in it. And then going into the unilateral work is the, the building muscle on that Absolutely. side. Absolutely. All right, so there's, there's three main ways that you can use isometrics, the, the different types of isometrics. The first way is before your workouts. I like using isometrics before I do my traditional workout because I'm activating more muscle fibers. I'm giving myself better ranges of motion or better stability and control. And this gives me a better workout. Like if I do isometrics before I bench press, this becomes more correctional, but it allows me to get better technique and form and get into the groove better. So MAPS Prime does a lot of this. In, uh, in priming. Priming is a lot of isometrics before you do your workout, mm -hmm. giving you better technique and form and getting more out of the exercises that you're doing. So if you're doing, uh, if you're doing isometrics before your workout, you're looking at, you know, 10 to 15 minutes before your workout. And this will trump any warm up that you've ever done. This is not just reducing risk of injury, mm -hmm. which is what warm ups are supposed to do. It's also activating more muscle fibers and just giving you better results. Yeah. And the, I mean, there's favorable posture for uh, performing these movements and regardless of information out there that likes to get into the nuance of, you know, morphology and, and how people, uh, bodies differ and whatnot, there's always going to be favorable positions to put your body in before you, uh, perform the movement. And so priming and being able to isometrically contract the muscles to be able to, uh, support that position uh, will put uh, an advantage into your workout like you've never had. Like, so this is something that will prep you um, and, and help you to perform at your highest. I'm so glad you brought that point up because this is an area where I think there's some contention with some of the things that we communicate on this podcast in regards to mobility and priming. And there, se there seems to be this uh, camp uh, and they're, they're an intelligent camp. There are a lot of, a lot of smart coaches and trainers that, uh, just advocate for you know doing more sets and that they're and they use the morphology argument all the time of like we're all so unique and different this idea of that we should squ squat all the same way or do these mm -hmm. exercises the same way and I really and even though there's some truth within that mm -hmm. I really don't like that message because in my experience every client that I've ever trained ha has room for improvement to the point you're making. There is a more optimal or there is a better position for you to be in to get the most 
from this workout and also to protect you from not getting hurt. Right. Mm -hmm. So So, on an individual basis. Right. So this idea of, oh, you know, mobility stuff is bullshit and all this. Like, I hate that movement in our space right now because it is such a terrible message because everybody, every, I don't care how advanced you are, can improve uh, their ability to move the weight uh, better, more safely, more effectively. And one of the best ways of doing that is by priming the body before you go into move, by activating certain muscles and maybe even relaxing other ones so that I put can put my body in the most optimal position to get the most from this exercise. Yes. So before your workout, isometrics serve two functions. One, wake up the muscles you're looking to wake up, activate more muscle fibers, and two, give you better movement so that you reduce your risk of injury and get better better reps, essentially. All right, the second way that isometrics are typically used is at the end of a workout. And this is how bodybuilders traditionally have used isometrics. This is when they flex and pose a muscle at the end of a workout. They just finished their chest workout. Now they're done, and now they're going to sit there and hold a chest squeeze for you know 30 seconds or 15 seconds or whatever. Mm-hmm. At the end of the workout, the benefits really are maximize the pump, and there is value in the pump in that it does signal muscle growth to an extent. But also, it's to get to wake up any dormant muscle fibers that might not have been woken up with that workout with a maximal exertion squeeze. But personally, after the workout, the value I see is the pump. Once I'm done with my workout and I want to really get every little ounce of blood into that muscle to send that pump signal, that's when I do something like this where I'll get into a position, squeeze the muscle, hold the hell out of it for you know 20 seconds, 30 seconds, rest, do a couple of those and Watch what happens. It takes your pump another 10% higher. Wouldn't wouldn't you make the case, too, that there's some benefit there, though, also for just simply being able to train your ability to activate the muscles that you want to call upon in a state of fatigue or exhaustion or like when you've totally. been spent? Mm-hmm. Like totally. One of the things that happens that's that to almost everybody when they lift is as soon as the muscle uh, fatigues, there's breakdown in the mechanics. And this is what we see a lot. Like somebody will be doing an exercise and then get three or four more reps, but the the muscles fatigue. So this idea of, oh, I've trained a whole hour now. I'm all done working mm-hmm. out. My entire body is fatigued, but then I could still call upon yeah. a ton of attention to right to the bicep mm-hmm. or right to my quad or whatever muscle that I'm activating. There has to be some value in training that skill so that when you go to apply that type of mental connection while you're in the middle of your workout, you have this, you've trained your ability, even under fatigue, to stay connected to the muscle that you want to activate. You're hardwiring a discipline there. Right. right, Within your lift, which is an important factor, because that is a very common um, way that uh, people don't squeeze out the maximal potential is because the breakdown happens on fatigue. There is a way to, to psychologically push through that and uh, be more disciplined in that. And so I think it is uh, that does apply very well. Yes. Now, you can also do correctional type isometrics at the end of the workout. And this is more for the analgesic effect. So if you finish your workout, oh, I'm a little sore in my shoulder. Then at the end, you can do some correctional type exercise. And what it'll do is it'll change the way your body moves afterwards. Because what tends to happen when you tweak your body a little bit is your movement patterns change a little bit. And sometimes those movement patterns end up causing more pain later on. So doing isometrics at the end in a correctional way yeah. can get your body moving a little better. So you're not walking or moving funny. And you know, you're not getting even more problems you know, later on. The third way, this is also a popular way bodybuilders like to use isometrics is in between sets. Now, the reason why this is valuable is if you are trying to feel a muscle in an exercise, Mm. there's almost no better way to get yourself to feel a muscle, especially a muscle you have trouble connecting to, than using isometrics in between sets. So let's say you're, you're, you're doing your presses and you just don't feel your chest in your bench press. Well, after you do a set in between, squeeze the hell out of your chest or get some bands or cables and hold a position or hold a position. You you pick. I like the squeeze position. Hold it, squeeze it, feel it. Then go do your bench press. And all of a sudden you can move and position yourself in a way to where you can feel the chest working. It's really effective for glutes, lats, hamstrings, areas that people tend to have issues feeling, especially when they're beginners. Well, wasn't it the uh Ben Bukowski, who's really highlighting the fact that, um, you know, certain muscles that are underdeveloped, it's, it's really a connection issue. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. so to, to be able to, um, 
call upon a muscle that you're trying to develop more within exercise, especially if it's a compound exercise or something where you're using a lot of muscles at once, um, to, to have that opportunity in between sets to, uh, enhance it and really, you know, fire it off, uh, and then take it back into that, that lift, uh, will, will help to, uh, put more emphasis on that. My favorite way to use this is what you were saying, Sal, and, and specifically to the butt. One of the most common, um, exercises that, uh, you know, my, a lot of times my female, but both male and female, but my female clients tend to care more about this is the ability to feel their butt working when they squat. And a lot of times they don't, they feel it in their quads and hamstrings everywhere else, but their butt. And so using like a floor bridge, an isometric floor bridge between sets was, I mean, this was something that like, this was Katrina for a long time. Katrina was, uh, has always been a pretty good squatter as far as strength. But she's like, my butt never gets sore. I never really feel it in 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 there. And now she was a big runner and she was very quad dominant and and because of those things. And so we had to use this a lot to get her to be able to activate that both squats and deadlifts for a while. But huge difference when you teach them that way. Cause it is like you, you know, you're you're telling you're loading somebody on their back and tell them to go through this movement. And you're, I mean, you're thinking stability and oh, I got all this weight and oh my God, just getting yeah. out of the hole. And so also to be saying, oh, and just use your butt to get out of that is really difficult. The body's gonna default to mm -hmm. what it's most comfortable doing or what it's been doing for years or decades in her case. And so getting the you to train like, no, you need to fire this, the isometrics in between sets, floor bridges in between squatting was like game changer for me. Yeah, uh, I did this to myself as a kid to feel my lats because when I first started working out my back, I didn't feel my lats. And I had read that squeezing the lats in between sets would help and it did. And then I did exactly what you did, Adam. This was the way I used isometrics with my clients. Before I learned about isometrics, I figured this is a great way to get my clients to feel certain muscle groups and it was most common was butt and yeah. I did exactly the same thing floor bridge at the top mm -hmm. squeeze your glutes oh you feeling burned now cool we rest a little bit do a set now all of a sudden they feel their butt when they're doing a squat yeah. alright I know you liked that episode if you did check this one out